All right, so now let me grab your... I'm not really hearing you. Do you want me to turn off the video or are you recording the video as well? I'm recording everything. Are you not hearing okay. me very well? It's just you're breaking up a little bit, so I'll just uh, sit tight. Hopefully it'll work out. All right, one second. Spam calls. All right, so uh, one second. Let me do one thing real quick. I just want to make sure that you're on. Uh, okay, so go ahead and uh, give us an introduction. Okay, well, my name is Leslie Mitchell Clark, and I am a board certified clinical master hypnotherapist. And I've actually been involved in mental health care for many years, uh, being a psychiatric technician in uh, the US. And um, I am probably best known uh, as a, a hypnotherapist who works in regression. Um, and when I say regression, I work in past life regression, interlife regression as the Michael, I'm a Michael Newtonian. Uh, but uh, I have a specialty uh, in that I work with uh, experiencers or individuals who believe that they have had uh, a close encounter of an with an alien being of, of some sort. So uh, I am on the Experiencer Research Project with MUFON. Uh, I also work with a group called TESA, the Experiencer uh, Support Association. And I work with many individuals who have, I guess what you would call missing time or, or memory blocks that prevent them from recalling their experiences fully. And uh, I'm also an author. Uh, my uh, book is my first book is called uh, Intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact. And I'm also the host of Contact TV, a very popular YouTube series that was originally Contact Radio and just a podcast. So that's that's just a little bit about me. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. So are you an experience for yourself? I actually had a very, um, well, I would say rather uh, dramatic experience when I was uh, only a teenager and I was working at a summer stock theater because I'm an actor too, but I was working at a summer stock theater when I was about 16 and uh, not only did a number of friends and I have a group sighting of craft, but I also had um, a rather disturbing encounter. Which, which is unlike most of what goes on. In, in my case, I think I was just wrong place, wrong time. Now, I do discuss it in my book. Would you, would you like to hear the, the story of that? Well, first of all, before you get into that, I want you to hold up your book if you've got a copy of it. Oh, you... I, do not, I do not have a copy, but it's a, uh, at my fingertips, but it's available on Amazon. And again, it's just called Intersections. A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact uh, from the Prometea Press, and you can find it on Amazon and very soon all uh, electronic formats as well. Is intersection singular or plural? Plural. Intersections and the subtitle is? Intersections, A True Story of Extraterrestrial Contact. Okay. Um, I would like. Oh, I do have. There it is. I got it. I found it. So, um, I'd like to hear you talk about anything about your own encounters that you're willing to uh, speak about. That's. I know that you want people to read your book, so you don't get too much of it away, but. <laughs> No, no, I can absolutely, uh, I can absolutely tell the story. No problem. I told it on air before and and after. It's it's uh, and it will it probably explain you know my you know my, well my lifelong interest, but certainly my interest since the teenage years in all kinds of, uh, ufology, uh, and related phenomena. So if you'd like me to go ahead, I'm I'm happy go ahead, to. Go ahead, sure. 
Okay, so uh, as I mentioned, I was uh, working as a, a, a young actress at a summer stock theater in the Black Hills of South Dakota, oddly, but uh, that for those of you that are not Americans, that's where the Rushmore heads are and it's Custer State Park and that's where the the horrible um, uh, Custer's last stand occurred not far from there. So it's a it's a very um, uh, ancient, uh, interesting part of the world and also sacred territory to the Lakota peoples. It's uh, it's their land, Paha Sapa. Anyway, I'm working in um, at the Black Hills Playhouse in Custer State Park. And um, one of the other actresses who was working there that summer uh, was a person who was an experienced professional. She was an entertainer, uh, a, a singer in uh, Las Vegas. Now, I knew there was something unusual about her from the moment I met her. Uh, she was just one of those people where, you know, she, she was just special. And she eventually told me that one of the reasons that she was you know, working at the Black Hills Playhouse that summer was that she was kind of hiding out because she herself was part of a government program uh, exploring psychic communication with uh, a certain um, type of ET. I, they were greys, I believe. But at any rate, she was involved with this program and they would, you know, they she'd go to an airplane, uh, you know, in a, in a unmarked airport and fly to what we now know would be Area 51 or Dreamland or one of those bases out there in the desert and with a lot of other psychic people she would engage in communication with these ET beings. Now at a certain point she decided that she did not want to do this work anymore mostly because the ETs were always omnipresent they were always bugging her to communicate they were always around so she um, she thought she would uh, take some time off well the government wasn't having it they they wanted her to continue with her work and one afternoon I was uh, sitting at the snack bar it was called and in front of the area where where she lived and where I lived the dorm where we lived an actual big black <laughs> late 70s era uh, car you know a Buick or a Lincoln town car you know what you would expect from the from the you know the typical men in black experience so this big car pulls up and that was anomalous enough you know in the middle of Custer State Park so it pulls up in front of our dorm and two I'm going to call them beings because they really looked unusual they were wearing black suits uh, and 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 hats like which the kind of hat you would see in the 1940s you know and I a hat they each had hats and from what I could see and I was probably I'm going to guess about 50 feet away from what I could see their skin was very well it almost looked plastic I don't know any other way to describe it it was sort of artificial looking and kind of shiny so that was their skin and additionally they were wearing their their pants their suit pants were like up way too high and and they were wearing you know very thick shoes almost as if they needed help uh you know in the gravity department or something i mean i don't, they looked like they were wearing orthopedic shoes <laughs> so they went into her you know her quarters and i saw them go in and they were there for maybe half an hour then they left and drove away and she told me that you know, again, these were, you know, your classic men in black who were trying to convince her to stay in the program. Now, every time that, you know, I became very friendly with this gal and every time we drove to town or went any place, she was always followed by craft. So I cannot even tell you how many sightings I had that summer. Uh, 30, maybe something like that and I'm talking about illuminated craft that were close enough for me to detect a cylindrical or ovoid shape that would follow us through the hills you know into the town of Custer or whatever so this was a real thing that was going on all the time um, now one night and um, 
although I was young, I had a boyfriend that I was involved with and we were, you know, sleeping together in his room. So one night uh, and I was awakened sleeping next to my boyfriend and the room was illuminated with blue. I always remember that it was a blue color, but it was illuminated with blue. And I was hearing a sound, not like a motor really, but more like a 10 cycle sound, sound that's so low infrasound that you can't even really hear it. You can more feel it. So that's what was going on. And then the, and then the room was illuminated with this blue light. So I was trying to wake up my boyfriend. I was shaking him. I think I was pounding on him to wake up. Nothing that I could do was going to bring him out of his, uh, you know, induced trance. So that's the last thing that I have a conscious memory of, sitting up in that bed with the blue light and the infrasound going and trying to wake up my boyfriend. Now, the next thing that I remember consciously is uh, it's dawn and, um, these were kind of like cabins where the actors stayed. We had a bathhouse that was kind of up a hill, an old fashioned bathhouse. So it was, it was just dawn. And I remember feeling in terrible uh, pain, um, almost like, you know, the world's worst menstrual cramps, terrible pain, burning pain that was gynecological in nature somehow. And so uh, my memory is that I came to and I was walking up the, this hill to the bathhouse. I think my nightgown was on backwards, something like that. And I had blood running down my leg. Now, it was not time for a menstrual period. Uh, it was anomalous and it was accompanied by terrible pain. Um, eventually, I did see a doctor because the discomfort did not stop. And uh, the doctor who was not a gynecologist, he was a, you know, he was a MD who was just your run of the mill mainstream doctor. He told me that I had something called cervical erosion, which only occurs if a woman has had a number of children. It's a kind of a thing where the lining of the cervix pooches out a little bit just from all of the birthing experiences. And I was a 16 year old girl. I mean, I was practically virginal, you know, and, and so this was the condition that was diagnosed by the doctor at that time. Now, what happened to me during those missing hours, which I would guess to be maybe from midnight till six in the morning, um, I myself, although I do this professionally, I have never explored it myself, uh, frankly, because I think I have a pretty good idea of what might have happened, and I don't really want to know the details myself. I can just sort of accept it and and move past it. But that's my that is my story. Um, now, since that time there, I have had several sightings of craft in my life, but I have not had uh, the kind of encounter that many of my clients do where they have conversations and they have ongoing relationships and they get picked up and they go, you know, I, I haven't had those kinds of experiences. So why do you think, um, it sounds like you were pretty active there for a while, but now that you think you're not active anymore, do you have any idea why they stopped? Um, why, why this didn't continue when I left the Black Hills, that, that kind of, that kind of intense contact, is that your question? Well, where, where do you um, live I guess the answer where, where do you live now? I live in Toronto. I live very... You went from South Dakota to Toronto. And generally, my understanding is that they don't care where you're at. They're going to come for you. So you, I'm, not, I'm not saying anything. You, I'm not doubting anything you've said. I'm not a mm. skeptic. Yeah, I'm an experience. I'm just trying to understand why they stop. They should still well, be here. I think, Mike, I think there are 
different kinds of relationships that that ETs have with us. I think some of them are genetically driven. They're very they're very similar to us physically and they're and they're more or less than they're benevolent and they're sort of watching over us, but they do tend to encounter with individuals from the time they're infants. You're absolutely right. Most experiencers upwards of 90% have ongoing contact experiences from the time they are children, you know, and earlier. I think in this case, um, it was almost a wrong time, wrong place thing for me. I think it was my contact with the girlfriend of mine who had regular engagements with these ETs. I think I somehow got on their radar. Oh, okay. And as far as uh, as far as I know, for, uh, you know, following that experience, although, you know, I've had many metaphysical encounters and such, um, I have never had um, an experience like that one. Um, so I think it was, I think it was as anomalous probably as uh, Travis Walton's experience. Uh, again, wrong place, wrong time. He he came across a uh, he came across a craft that was probably doing some type of survey or gathering plants or who knows what, and he jumped into a tractor beam, and and had this experience. So with him, I also think it was a wrong place, wrong time. So I think that can happen, and I think that's what happened to me in that circumstance. So in these experiences, did you ever you saw the beams, right? So what they look like. I have I have no memory from the the, the the last thing I remember is the is being surrounded in the blue light surrounding the room, the 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 the, the uh, infrasound, the low set ten cycle infrasound, and and then waking up, sort of like waking up, walking up to the bathhouse at dawn. So now I if if I wish to, I, I could go to one of my colleagues and explore the experience. However, I am pretty much certain that there was some type of genetic material that they were after, uh, that they extracted. Uh, that is my feeling of what happened to me. So the only beings you've seen so far are the men in black the one time, correct? Well, I have had, I have had other other sightings of uh, humanoid beings, Pleiadian type beings as well. And um, can although, you go through those? pardon me. Can you go through those? Well, I have a um, one of the client that I wrote my recent book with, um, uh, or he contributed heavily, is Wes Roberts. He's uh, and. I had the privilege to work with him on a number of occasions. Um, maybe we had maybe something like 40 sessions together, a lot of hypnosis sessions together. And his engagements were always with tall, slender humanoid beings. And a female being appeared to me on several occasions when I was working with him in, uh, in hypnotic regression in my office. So, when you say she, uh, first of all, describe her. What? Describe her. Describe her. Extremely slender, um, and and quite tall. In fact, I would say um, probably over six feet. Something like that, slender, tall, and almost in a way, almost androgynous looking. There wasn't a lot of uh, female female shape, but definitely the being uh, presented a female vibration and had long uh, platinum hair. And very, uh, the eyes were almost, they were, they were humanoid, but they were a little bit, a little bit slanted, but kind of like Scandinavian people look. I mean, I'm half Swedish and some of my cousins have those almost Asiatic looking eyes. It's the far north, it's not unusual. So, so yes, that's what she looked like. So, um, what, if you had to classify her, classify her, as a particular being, what would you call her? Was she a gray? Was she a Nordic? Or oh, she, she, 
she was a, a she was a Nordic or Pleiadian. She was absolutely not a gray. No, she was she would definitely fall into. Now, of course, within the Pleiades, there are a lot of civilizations that are similar. There's the, the um, there's the Lyrans, uh, there's the Yael. Uh, there are many humanoid beings that are in the Pleiades cluster that we engage with all the time. Which, if somebody asks you, say, let's say you were on a, a you were in a courtroom and you're sitting up on. You know, Stan, and they're asking you, "What was she? What would you, what would you call her? What would you, if you had to guess, what would you say she was?" I would say that she was a humanoid Nordic, and most probably from the Lyran system, and most probably a Pleiadian. So, what, could she walk down Main Street and nobody look at her strange? I think I think she could if she was wearing, you know, now the way she presented to me, she was wearing kind of a, uh, I guess I call it a unitard. And I remember it being blue in my mind. So a kind of a one piece kind of, you know, all purpose kind of outfit, like one cloth, one leotard. But if she put on, if she put on just the kinds of clothes we walk around in, I think she absolutely could. She would. She was very tall for a female, though, but that that happens. That's not a big deal. But aside from her height, she she could pretty much fit in anywhere. I think so, and I think there are, I think there are many beings from uh, from the Lyran system who are living amongst us as as humanoids because they can. I I don't think that's uncommon at all. And you know, also, you know, we're we're the hybrid beings. You know, humanoids on this planet. We were genetically engineered by the Anunnaki, so we, you know, we are in fact uh, the the stuff of stars in a way we're partially indigenous beings uh because i believe according to the ancient cylinder scrolls that were translated by zechariah sitchin the the anunnaki used a very amenable compassionate uh form of miocene ape kind of what you would you know, before Neanderthal and worked with that kind of being to upgrade it genetically. And that's what we are. We are, we are hybrid beings. So what, is there anything, any, any direct knowledge you have for your clients or personally, or, you know, beyond what you may have read or, or you know, heard about through uh, maybe through the web or something? Is there any kind of fairly direct knowledge you have about the Anunnaki? Well, what happens sometimes is some of my clients uh, sort of channel information. Most of my clients have at least one being that they engage with regularly who, you know, if they're still, you know, going on craft and having interactions, there's usually a being that is kind of their touch point. And uh, very often now uh, I can, you know, induct my clients into a hypnotic uh, trance and they are able to communicate psychically with the beings with whom they engage. And so at that time, very often I will ask questions, you know, and just see if they will validate or give me other information or, and, you know, what I'm, what I'm hearing uh, consistently is that many, many, many advanced civilizations have engaged with our world uh, pre-Ice Age, pre-Flood, post-Ice Age, post-Flood, and we are, you know, it's like the five fingers of man. We are comprised with a lot of the DNA by the various cultures that have visited us in unrecorded history or history that we have forgotten with our global amnesia. Well, let me ask you a direct question. Um, I've gotten very conflicting information about the Anunnaki from different people. Uh, one um, ha is very has a, a strong affinity for the Anunnaki, and her husband has researched them. And uh, she says one thing. I have another lady I interviewed. 
and she says something very different about the Anunnaki. So I don't know who to believe. So um, the question the question that comes to my mind about the Anunnaki is one, the lady that uh, contradicts the other couple says that the Anunnaki are reptilian, and then the the no. lady husband says they're not. They're not. <laughs> you know, that reptilian Anunnaki thing is the fault of a mistranslation and, and a lack of understanding or knowledge on whoever says they are reptilian. They talk a lot. In, in Now, we have to go back. If we're going to focus on the Anunnaki, we have to go back to our biggest source of information, which are the ancient Sumerian cylinder scrolls. And they were many, many of those scrolls were translated by one of the world's foremost lingu linguists, Zachariah Sitchin. Now, the Anunnaki had all kinds of, you know, outfits for doing different things. And when they had to go underwater, when they traveled sometimes in, 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 uh, in their craft, they talked about their fish suits. So they had some type of uh, industrial uh, wear that was used when they were either, you know, dealing with the water or they were traveling in space and it looked shiny. It was made out of material that looked like a fish skin. Now this has been mistranslated. Uh, and so you have later people, not in the time, not 60,000 years ago, not in the time of the Anunnaki, but you have later people uh, creating um, art and hieroglyphs, which describe the which show the Anunnaki as reptilian when they most certainly are not the planet Nibiru is part of or they genetically the Anunnaki genetically are again part of the Lyran system they are humanoids tall humanoids and Nordic looking most of them would have blonde hair and be even the women would be seven feet tall very tall tall beings and um, they, they, their planet has a large, uh, I would have to call it an elliptical orbit. They are in our solar system, but they are, you know, at the outer reaches of our solar system. And they travel an elliptical orbit that is so huge that one year for them, in other words, one trip around the sun from them is, uh, is, uh, uh, Three, you know, 3,600 3, years, 3,600 years. So they don't age in the same way that we do. But uh, they are related to us uh, genetically. They came here because they needed gold to repair their atmosphere. They had no labor. They started with their own labor. Those guys revolted and refused to work uh, in the mines in South Africa. And so they decided to uh, speed up nature and upgrade genetically the existing uh, Miocene apes that were on this planet that had developed here naturally. Well, my understanding of the of the Lyrans and the reptilians is that we came from Lyra, and the way we did it was reptilians attacked Lyra, and then the Lyrans fled to come here. And so, if what you're saying is correct, then we're uh, a product of the Lyran, the Anunnaki, who came from Lyra, who were chased out by the reptilians. Is that, is that correct? Well, they, well, the Anunnaki were never chased out by reptilians. They had, they had nuclear war amongst themselves, but they had nothing to do with any kind of reptilian situation. Now there are reptilians and some of them are negative and some of them are 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 benevolent. They exist as beings and that's not a surprise because that is the that's kind of the chain or the branch of life that they, you know, evolved on whereas we are more, you know, from the from the mammal, from the ape type of deal. But as far as I know, any information that I that that has credibility, any of the ancient translations, any of the material in the 12th planet, uh, a lot of the wonderful literature uh, by Sitchin and others, I have never seen any evidence that there was a that there was a war with the reptilians. And so, you know, the Lyrans 
fled and the Lyrans were the Anunnaki. The Anunnaki came here for one reason and one reason alone. They were looking for mineral assets. They they had to repair their atmosphere, which was extremely damaged. And we only know now that, you know, shooting gold, gold powder into the atmosphere will have a benevolent effect. We didn't even, you know, when all this came out, when, when Sitchin translated all this, we didn't even have an understanding of how that would even work. But now we do, thank God, from the, you know, the, the discoveries of science. But, um, yeah, that's... Uh, I, I don't find any credibility in this unfortunate idea based on mistranslations that the Anunnaki are reptilian. There's no evidence for that in my, my mind. So how many uh, experience or clients do you have, Bob? Or, I mean, like 100, 1,000, 10,000? Well, I wouldn't say, I certainly wouldn't say 1,000, but uh, I have been doing... I've been really focusing on this kind of work for the past 15 years. So, um, boy. Okay. Uh, I would say it is probably upwards of 800 maybe. Wow. My, pers my personal client, simply because, you know, I focus on that. And 15 years is a long time. I'm just guessing, but it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. So your story, Intersections, a true story of extraterrestrial contact, is that, how does that book focus? Is it your experiences, your clients' experiences, or what is the general gist of this, of the book? Well, I, I only included the experience that I told you about when we first started chatting here at the beginning of the podcast. That's, that's like an introduction that, that is in the book. But the focus, the whole focus of the book is really on the journey of my client, who we will call Wes Roberts. That's not his given name, but that's his, his, his uh, nom de plume for now. So the journey of Wes Roberts, he came to me, uh, he's a, he was a, was, is a, a uh, college university professor. So he came to me, you know, in midlife and um, first of all, was not able to sleep. He had these, he had these experiences of missing time uh, and, and all kinds of other stuff that, that it's, that's all symptomatic of a lifelong experiencer. So uh, what I did is I immediately regressed him and I looked into the current experience, whatever that was about, I can't remember, sorry. And then, um, and then I regressed him to probably the age of three, I'm guessing. I, I instructed him to go to the first experience of high strangeness. And we went back to about the age of three. So the, the book is about Wes really putting his life together, recovering the memories of many, many experiences and coming to understand what his, like why him and what his role is in this, in this, what seems like it might be a bizarre process. So uh, it's, it's all about Wes Roberts. It's about his journey and um, it's got a lot of fascinating stuff into in it because there are a lot of, a uh, lot of ET encounters and a lot of information um, about all that. So how many races did he uh, have direct encounters with? What, not different races, how many races? Um, in, in his recollections, um, you know, there, frequently there are small grays involved because they're, they're sort of like worker bees for many of the more evolved species. And sure. at this point, I almost, I almost think that some of the grays are not fully biological that they have been maybe engineered for space travel or something like that. So, uh, so Wes has seen several varieties of greys, some small and difficult to communicate with. They can only communicate with telepathically with very limited sentences or words. He's seen uh, taller greys that appear that are, that are more evolved and they can communicate very directly with us. Uh, he has seen reptilians. He has seen insectoids. Uh, he has, and of course, the, the dominant species that he deals with um, are these beings that I described to you earlier, and particularly a female being 
that he calls his twin because uh, because he feels that they have such a such a connection. And she's uh, what type of being is she then? The lady? Uh, well, she she would be as I was saying, she Nordic. would be uh, in the. Uh, a, a Nordic tall and the Pleiadian, you know, in that scope of those types of beings, the Yael, the, you know, the Sholonai, you know, all, all those beings have a similar look. So his overall experience was a positive one. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the disturbing experiences are very few and far between. And, you know, something that I just, you know, kind of want to put out there because this is, this is, come to be part of my belief system, I absolutely firmly believe that there is an existence, what we would call the secret space program or the black ops program. I believe that there is a, that there is militarized um, uh, space travel and we also have bases on the moon and we have bases on Mars at this very moment. And that in the space program, a secret space program, many young men men have been recruited and actually, you know, served tours of duty on, on Mars and other places. Uh, someone whose work, you know, or, or if anybody is interested particularly in the secret space program and how it uh, coordinates with uh, ET contact, I would recommend that uh, your listeners uh, Google uh, Captain Randy Kramer, and that is Kramer with a C. Captain Randy Kramer is uh, probably, uh, he, in my mind, he is the most valid of all of the individuals who are now talking about the secret space program. And Randy has had three separate lie detector tests done by Gaia TV because he appeared on a number of their, um, their programs. So uh, um, also um, uh, Andrew Basciago, uh, who is an attorney in, uh, in, in Washington state. He is another individual who has deep knowledge of the secret space program. So uh, some, of, some of Wes's encounters have involved also the um, unwanted uh, invasive activities of the primarily U.S.-based secret space program. So, have any of your clients uh, come out publicly? Any of them? Uh, yes. In fact, uh, uh, Wes Roberts, of course, came out, although he's not using his real name, he came out publicly and we were on many news programs and did lots of media. So, in that sense. Um, but it is more common uh, for individuals to be worried, to be concerned with secrecy and to not want to come out as you say and and Mike I work with people from all kinds of walks of life I mean you you could really say that the experiencer phenomena cuts across all boundaries of uh, financial position societal position education it cuts through all of that and um so I have people coming to me who are very humbly educated, maybe a high school diploma. I have people coming to me who are attorneys, uh, doctors, judges, educators. So it's a very, it's a very wide spectrum. Um, and I think, I think what's important, one of the things that's important to the extraterrestrials is I think that they are looking for it individuals who have psychic abilities who they can communicate more easily with. I, I think that's part of it. I think that they are really, they may, they follow family lines in which psychic travels, particularly through the female line. I think that they're really looking for individuals with these, with these, as we would say, high PSI abilities. Uh, I would agree with you very much. Uh, I've only had one, uh, abductee hypnotherapy clients so far, only one. Mm -hmm. And uh, she said the exact same thing that I asked her why her, and she said it was because of her high side talent. That was it. She had no, yeah, no other reasons. Yes. I hear this. I hear this again and again, and I hear that it runs in family lines and it's a simple case of 
um, looking for people who can who they can communicate with most easily. And uh, I think most of the advanced civilizations that uh, that um, uh, experiencers deal with are primarily telepathic communicators. Now the greys, some of the little greys and some of the greys don't really have mouths that seem to function as far as language. But of course, the, the more humanoid beings can do both. So, um, is there any particular race that you think, besides the greys, uh, that we're in contact with uh, most frequently. I, I know everybody knows the Greys are doing most of the work here, but as far as contact, well, besides them, is there any other race that you think is, you know, like the next most commonly encountered? You know, in your in your experience from your 800 plus clients, mm -hmm. which besides the Greys, what other race do you think? has more contact with us than any other race aside from the birds? I think the most uh, common communications are with the beings that are most like us, that are that are that are the most humanoid. I think that is the most common experience. Now uh, there are also an awful lot of experiences with insectoid beings that are benevolent. Now I know the whole idea of insectoids is very, you know, disturbing to us. You know, we don't like the way they look, you know, big bugs, you know, it's scary. Um, so many times when, um, although we actually have a lot of uh, dealings with insectoids, they don't like for us to see them because they know that it disturbs us. So insectoid beings commonly show up all the time, but usually they're in dark robes, like almost like a, like a monk or a friar, like a medieval monk. They wear hooded robes and they try very hard to stay off to the side so that, so that we don't see them. Now, when, when individuals have been, uh, have been having experiences since they were children, we find that these insect beings are very often involved in um, uh, medical examinations. I'm not saying anything painful or bad, but just, you know, benign medical uh, examinations. So some, some experiencers will refer to these beings when they're children as the brown doctors, but they are in fact insectoid beings who are the geneticists of our, uh, you know, of our, um, our corner of the universe. They are expert geneticists, apparently, which is one of the reasons why they, why they are always, you know, working with us and working with teams of other ETs and what have you. Well, what you said about the ones that look like us being the most common, that's what, that's what Free is putting out. I, it, it seems like your information and theirs is um, coincides. And I've only personally had contact with uh, one contact was with uh, beings, whatever they were, who if you saw them, there's no way in the world you'd ever know they were aliens. They looked exactly yeah. like aliens. And then the other encounter I had was with a being that was invisible. And so Free says it's either uh, ones that look like us or ones that are energetic. And it's either one mm -hmm. of those two. So that all. Yes. Yes. Now, I, I, I also work with free. I forgot to mention that Ray Hernandez is an old friend. So I also do work for them when regressions are required. But yeah, that's the information that they're, <clears throat> we're all kind of gathering, <coughs> excuse me, the same sorts of informations, I, I believe. And um, I think that. Uh, I think that not only are experiences on the increase, positive experiences, but lots and lots of people are what I would call waking up right now. It's very common for someone to come to me in midlife. That is my most common age group for individuals who believe they may have had an experience or they only have partial conscious memory or, or what have you. It's usually in midlife that 
that people come to me and wake up. And uh, OK, so I guess. Um, is. Is breeding the number one, number one reason uh, why, why people are having contact? Well, uh, um, I think that we have to go back to answer that question fully. We have to go back to um, uh, not only uh, we have to go back to Harry Truman and Dwight D. Eisenhower. And now if if any of your listeners have have read the wonderful book, uh, The Day After Roswell by by uh, Corso, by Philip Corso, uh, he talks a good deal about what happened with regards to that initial <laughs> treaty with with the greys that crashed uh, in Roswell. Now, uh, um, Lieutenant Colonel Corso was in charge of the. Uh, he was in charge of disseminating high tech um, tech technology from the greys to the various big industrialists uh, like, uh, you know, Hughes Aircraft or the Skunk Works or Monsanto or, you know, so so the idea was uh, they had this foreign technology department. Uh, the U.S. Army had a foreign technology department. Well, yes, the technology was foreign. All right. It was very foreign. <laughs> And so Corso was running the Department of Foreign Technology and he was taking discoveries that that the ETs, a specific group of greys, had given uh, the military, the government, and it was his job to place these these um, these high tech uh, devices, which later turned into fiber optics, integrated circuitry, and even Velcro, you know, so he, his job was to place this stuff. Now, this technology was being received by the U.S. military because there was a deal made between our, the U.S. government, and, um, and it was uh, instigated by, or not instigated, but it was agreed to by by um, Harry S. Truman and later followed through with Dwight D. Eisenhower. So in exchange for receiving the technology, much of which, which we now all use effortlessly, in exchange for that, the United States government gave that particular group of greys, gave them leave to abduct a certain amount of human beings so that they could take genetic material and try to revitalize the problems they had where they could no longer reproduce. Now, this was a contract and it expired fairly recently. I mean, about five years ago or 10 years ago. So the fact is that these kind of these kind of brutal abductions where genetic material is taken, they were being done by one specific group and they were being done with the permission of the United States or maybe even the world governments. I'm, I, I can't really speak to everyone that was involved. I mean, the Canadians and the Americans are in bed together, certainly with all of this, but um, but that's the history of why there were abductions by greys and genetic material, sperm and ova were taken unwillingly from random humans. And uh, it was an exchange for high tech materials. So, OK, so. That's the breeding part. Uh, is that. That information, does that uh, correlate with what your clients are saying, that the reasons why they are having encounters? I mean, you know what I'm saying, right? The question. Well, so, yes, yeah, some, uh, some of my clients, their experiences did involve a negative, uh, um, you know, uh, violation of having their genetic material taken. Some of them have had those experiences, but they're in the minority, especially now as we move through time, because this type of abdu abduction is no longer allowed. And also through the information that I get from my clients, and I mean almost all of them, there is a kind of 
uh, intergalactic uh, association, not unlike you know Gene Roddenberry's um, uh, you know United Federation of of planets. Uh, there there are, and you know we as Terrans, as Earth people, we're not quite ready to step up and join the uh, the other you know if you want to call them class one civilizations look at what's going on our on our planet we're still murdering each other we're still killing each other in the streets we're still idiots you know so uh, we're we're like a you know we're like preschoolers I think in the scope of what's happening and uh, so we are unlikely to have a real face to face. 3D physical interaction, public publicized physical interaction with um, with evolved beings until we get our shit together. Pardon the expression. I think they're waiting for us and giving us all the help we can to to evolve to where we can participate without being a danger to ourselves and to others. And look what we've done. You know, right wing idiots have have elected a a mentally ill, toxic narcissist as their as their as their leader. So we're we're a long way from being able to take our place in any kind of federation of sophisticated beings, in, in my opinion. So if they were um, taking people for breeding purposes at one time and that's no longer allowed. Uh, according to your clients, what is the current reason for contact more than anything else? I would say that the, the majority of my clients have made agreements. Agreements went in place before they were born into this physical life in the interlife. Now, I don't know, Mike, if you do much regression work, but... Um, I, I follow the work of Michael Newton, who was the guy that really discovered or that we have an interlife. And, and that is where where we are after we pass. And that's where we are before we come back into physical life as far as re reincarnation is concerned. So what many of my clients tell me is that they made agreements in the interlife to do the important work of trying to speed up our spiritual evolution, to wake people up, to speak about their experiences and, um, and help humanity. You know, so a lot of my, you know, a lot of my clients really are kind of like, you know, midwives of the new era. They had an intention to come here and, and work insightfully with evolved ET beings for the benefit of humanity. So that's what I'm hearing. So you you believe, based on what your clients are telling you, that the current reason for contact is spiritual the speeding up of spiritual evolution. Yes, I do. I do believe that. And and what seems to be happening too, and this is this is quite interesting, Mark, I think uh, Mike, I think, what seems to be happening is that as experiencers move through their lives, the earlier contacts are much more physical. They get picked up, they go, you know, they're taken aboard, you know, uh, they're, they're taught things, they have lessons, they, they engage with other children, they're, they're hybrid children, all kinds of things go on. And then what seems to happen is that when experiencers reach a certain age of majority, if you will, they begin having primarily what I would call etheric experiences where, you know, they go to sleep at night and then they, they bilocate, if you wish. You could call it remote viewing. You could call it uh, astral projection. It's, it's all kind of the same thing. But they, they bilocate and kind of go to work with a with a crew with like an ET crew doing different stuff and they're all doing different stuff some of them are working with children they're all doing different things but there seems to be a switch from having to go physically to the much more efficient and equally 
solid in, in, in their dimensions or whatever, the, the ability to bilocate and bilocate with an image and some type of an etheric body, uh, like a psychophysical body that can actually do stuff. So when they're taken, uh, when their astral body or their spirit or soul or whatever is taken uh, while they're in the dream state and they go to wherever the wherever they go yeah this place that they go is it on a higher plane is it on the physical plane where where do you think they're actually going to even though their astral body or their spirit or whatever is being taken is it what, what level do you think they end up on while they're over there doing that work where are they well i think that it's more a case of vibration so they might be, in fact, you know, making an interdimensional adjustment. So uh, it could be that because they go to really normal places. It's not like they're traveling in angelic realms. They go to a craft. Some of them have desks. They, they have told me about teaching that they're doing. So it's very physical and it's and it takes place. Um, sometimes they talk about going to to um, office buildings or or schools that are in fact on other planets because of course if you're traveling uh etherically uh, you can go anywhere right so so they because thought travels faster than the speed of light sure so so they are um they're doing things that are very physical. So it's not like they go over there and they're and they're they're meditating and becoming one with a with a God consciousness so much. It's not really like that. It's it's different from the afterlife, in other words. It's not that kind of thing from if what I hear is any example. But they go to uh, they go to buildings, they go to craft, they go to uh, military bases that are other places on other planets. Um, sometimes I can't always find out where they are. You know, I have to ask for like if they can see out of windows. You know what I mean? I, I have to try to get snippets of information sometimes that I'm it, it's not always clear where they go, but it's an organized place either in a craft or a or a mothership or a stable structure that that they travel to that must exist in lighter energy uh, or a faster vibration. That's so that's think, my guess. So you think it might be on a different dimension? I think it may be if we if we could you know use that term. I, I think it's just probably a different frequency. You know, I think everything is like uh, everything oscillates and. Oh, I got, I got. The, you know, that's the reason we can't necessarily see beings that are here. It's because their matter is 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 vibrating at, at a very quick level. I often think that maybe the only difference between people who are psychic and can see entities and those that can't are the simple ability of those people that see things and their ability to perceive quickly moving matter. You know? So it could be this... This dimension just a different frequency. Yeah, I believe that that's what we're really talking about because it's very physical. It's and sometimes people even bring back, you know, like uh, uh, if they were doing something repetitive or if they were on the craft and they had to give a give a, a skin sample or something, they will come back with a physical evidence of that having happened. And so the. If, so the etheric body or, or the psychophysical body informs our dense physical body. So um, what do you know about uh, plane, different planes of existence? Like, like, uh, like, are you familiar with the astral plane? Well, um, I do an awful lot of past life regression, as you know, and inner life regression. So people passing to the angelic realms or the uh, or the um, uh, the the level where most souls go after they leave the physical body is usually a very blissful thing. And um, and in fact, you know, a, a light realm 
a, a light realm, both light energy and light as far as, you know, it being uh, brilliantly lit, you know, in that kind of way. So, so you're that's about the a afterlife, correct? Well, I yes, I'm talking about the afterlife where somebody where somebody when this when the body dies, when the body stops working and the and the spirit rises up out of the body, um usually there's a commonality. They are usually people pass through some type of doorway or tunnel or access point and then also another commonality is they usually have um, if not beloved family members sometimes a religious figure I mean it could be everybody from you know Mohammed to the to you know another Dalai Lama you know religious figures or family members usually meet individuals when they cross over so and then they go through a process so you think that Michael Newton got it right I do. I do. Because every all the work that I do supports what he found. You know, I, I and you you know, Mike, we one of the things that we have to do and, and I and I know that you you do this in your practice is we have to be very careful not to put ideas or images or thoughts into somebody's subconscious or conscious. You know, especially if we're doing any kind of regression, we can't we can't lead the witness as it were. So hopefully, I hope because I've tried so hard. I hope that I am like a uh, you know like a, a a plain you know a plain un uh, un, un what, what's the word I'm looking? For? I hope that I am a neutral voice, completely neutral, without insinuation, without. Uh, without any kind of agitation for the reality that I would like to hear about or I would like to create. You know what I'm saying, Mike? I'm sure you've found that in, in the asking of questions, we have to be pretty like vanilla and pretty because the subconscious mind is literal. It is actually literal. Um, so there you go. So who do, do you, uh, if I said, the, if I led you on and I said something like, they control the planet, who, is that false or is there a they? And if so, who is they? Well, right now the idiots are controlling the planet. <laughs> I don't think, you know, let me, let me, put, there are, there's a lot of, you know, conspiracy theorists love to talk about, you know, the, the Illuminati and the Bilderbergs and they, they love to talk about this stuff. But the basic facts are here. We don't need any help from outsiders, from other uh, civilizations, whether they be extraterrestrial or not, to create a mess. We don't need any help from anybody else being awful to each other. That is the that's the beast like part of us that comes from our indigenous, you know, comes from our roots, you know, our part of our roots here on this planet. And um, I just I abs I just don't believe that there are ETs uh, that are controlling or involved. I think we are doing this ourselves, and I think. The main evil of the world is probably greed, greed and lack of compassion and ego. These are the things that we have in abundance and we don't need any influence from anybody else to really make a mess of stuff. Well, there was one flaw I found in Michael Newton's work and uh, he didn't believe in attaching spirits. How say you? Well, I've dealt with attaching spirits. You know, I, 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 I have done, we, like there's a, in my certification in metaphysical hypnosis, we have a whole section that even deals with what we call energy release or entity release. So on that point, I would have to diverge from Michael Newton. I think there's a lot of astral trash around. I think there, I think there are a lot of beings that haven't crossed over successfully and they can, uh, absolutely become attached individuals, especially if that individual opens the door in some kind of way, like uses a Ouija board or some other kind of practice where they don't protect themselves or do any kind of protection before they start to reach out. You say that you've worked with 
uh, relatively 800 uh, experiencers. How many people have you worked with who have attachments or had attachments? Well, it's quite small, Mike. Um, probably, in, probably in my whole career, there have maybe only been 20 people where I believe there was an actual conscious entity who was, you know, squatting inside that person. But some, that being said, sometimes people are carrying trauma or fear or that, that manifests as a entity, but it isn't actually, it's a, it's a psychological dissociation. So in that circumstance, even then I might go through the protocol of releasing the the negative entity because it, it, it can be therapeutic whether or not there is a consciousness that is attached, a separate consciousness. So of all the people who came before you that you learn from who do uh, removal of attaching spirits, who whose work do you follow in protocol? Would it be somebody like William Baldwin or whose work uh, teaches you about well this? well my my mentor and teacher in um, not only uh, past life regression and uh, interlife regression and energy release would be dr. Georgina Cannon and I learned her protocol uh, now her interlife protocol came directly from from Newton but she has worked of course with other individuals as well so uh, the way that she approaches this, is my modality. Okay, so we make the we, we, we make the we, we find the location of the entity where it's squatting and we get it to, to identify itself and and reveal why it's there. And then we and then we get it to leave. So um Of all the attaching spirits you've dealt with so far, uh, quick, if you can, quickly list what they were. Do you mean like incubus, succubus, like what kind any, of thing anything, they were? Any, anything, whatever you've found so far. What's the, the most one? What's the number one type of attaching uh, entity of any kind? What, what, what is it? And well, number two, I, number three. I don't know. Well, let me give you. I don't think I could possibly remember more than five, more than five. My old brain, but um, one that's very recent. It's is that um, there is a there is a young lady who is being attacked nightly by a uh, what I would have to call you know a, a, an incubus. You know a a a male. Uh, sexually driven entity that is maybe was never even in human form. I mean, you know, in these areas, you know, we might even feel that we could use the term a demon or a demonic figure. There are beings in the astral plane that were never physical, that were never humanoid. So at any rate, this, this, um, this young woman for the past three years, every night she has been assaulted by this being that presents itself uh you know looking like you know really your 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 standard uh you know uh central casting kind of demonic figure and she herself she you know there there seem there has to be somewhere a trigger or there has to be something that has occurred that has allowed this entity access. And in her case, she was in deep grief and became vulnerable. So, so we are now uh, working in the realms of protection and I have uh, several remote viewers who are now going in at night and uh, protecting her from this entity. And uh, hopefully soon we can blow it out into outer space. And that's what we're working on to destabilize it, dematerialize it. So if I, if, uh, I ask you a simple question, 
What's the number one type of attaching being? What would that be? What would you say that would be? Um, the number one type of attachment is probably something that has been sent through magic. Now, I, I know this is not going to sound rational, and I am a rational person. I'm uh, really involved in science and, and straight ahead medicine. So, but what seems to be possible is that there are there are magical practitioners of the dark side who target and their enemies for whatever reason. And a lot of this seems to be happening to to women who have gotten out of marriages where where the family of the ex spouse practices some kind of santoria or some kind of thing like that. So it seems as if the number one thing that I encounter, if you're talking about energy release or entity release, are entities that have been sent to disturb a specific victim, their victim. And um, and usually that will happen. They won't let the, they won't let the the person sleep. They are continually bombarded with negative, dangerous thoughts, what I would call invasive thoughts. Um, they can be attacked physically with chronic illnesses that have no uh, medical basis, you know, things like hives or eczema, you know, uh, intestinal pain. So all of these things can go on. And I have dealt with probably, probably uh, the largest number of, of the kinds of things where I have used those techniques have been this kind of deal. So are these... Demons or are these jinn or are these just uh, something the uh, the magician create uh, or magical uh, witch or what, whatever you want to call the, uh -huh. the person that's sending the uh, the spirit are these created by them or just called by them? I believe they are more called by them. So we probably are looking more at demonic uh, spirits that are like the Orishas or, or, you know, they are, they are metaphysical beings that get contacted and to do the will of the practitioner. So I think that is, it's more commonly that type of thing. Now, now gin, there's a whole nother subject and, and I wish we had a lot of time to talk about that, but gin also can, um, can, you know, possess human beings. They, they love to mess about with human beings. And so it could be something like that. And of course, jinn, they are, you know, they're more like, they're a separate phylum. They're more like angels, you know, they're something else. They're described in the Holy Quran and the Bible, smokeless fire. So they're energy beings of some sort that were never human, but they are also completely capable of behaving in a way that one would call possession. Well, okay, so let's take jinn and demons together just for a moment. Uh, beyond what we've said so far, um, where do you think these beings exist? If, is it? Do you think it's the like the lower astral plane? Is that the plane of the jinn and the demons? I think it's the lower astral plane. I do. It's 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 quite physical, but it's not densely physical. And you know the uh, the Asians or the Japanese particularly talk about that that astral realm as the uh, where the hungry ghosts are. Hungry ghosts meaning individuals that are still attracted to physicality, to the physical pleasures, to drinking or doping or sex or whatever you want to call it. They're still attached. They have not moved on. And so those kinds of beings, the astral trash beings are there and also beings that, that were never fully physical, that are. So have you traveled any at all um, in any planes beyond the physical? Like 
when you dream or in, in any other fashion? Have you gone out of your body or have you astral projected or do you go places at night that you think of are those realms as opposed to just your average dream? Or have you done any type of, of uh, traveling at all yourself of any kind? I, I think so, Mike. I think I used to do it quite automatically as a child. I think I I think it happened all the time when I was a child. Um, at this at this current point in my life, I've been a, a transcendental meditator for over forty years. I think so. Whenever I meditate, I travel and I travel to high plateaus and I meet metaphysical beings and I see masters and other light beings. So I have those experiences all the time without taking ayahuasca just from being a meditator and anyone can. It's nothing special about me. It's just being able to, maybe my, maybe from all the years of meditation, maybe I have more DMT, maybe my pineal gland is more stimulated. I don't know, but whatever it is, I, I do that regularly. And then also, um, I am uh, quite a student of remote viewing. So I do also have some skills as far as directing my consciousness where I would like it to go. And I have, in fact, worked on cases with um, uh, missing children. I have worked on some other uh, situations. I, I, I have been called in by uh, an expert remote viewer who has me on his team when it's something like that. So... Whose remote viewing techniques do you use? Oh, the well, well, Ingo Swan, of course, is the you know the foremost guy, but the um, uh, the Monroe Institute is uh, is where I have you know through the Monroe Institute is where I have gained most of my knowledge. But now, currently, I, I am studying something called psionics, which uh, again I'm going to mention uh, Captain Randy Kramer. Psionics is a is a I don't want to say more advanced, but it's a it's definitely a more in depth and more physical type of remote viewing, and that's what I am working on now. I'm learning that. Uh, that's my that's my uh, my current discipline that I'm working on. So, uh, Ingo was a natural psychic. Is is that who you are also? Well, I think I came in with, you know, psychic abilities, like genetic psychic abilities. And I know when I was a kid, I saw things all the time. I, when I would go to mass to pray, I would see some people would have what I now know to be auras. I would see them. I saw entities. So I think I came in with a certain amount of natural, untrained skill. But I would like to think that during my during my years of spiritual discipline that I have uh, increased that or at least tried to structure it and tried to make it a, a better tool and, and I try to get better all the time. You said you saw entities. Tell us uh, what you saw and when and how. Oh, go uh, spirits? Ghosts? Sure, anything. Oh, boy. Well, that's, boy, that's, been, that's been nonstop. That happens all the time. Uh, in fact, I'm, I'm a member of the uh, a, a, a group, you know, the Durham Ghost Hunters, and we go and do psychic investigations. So seeing that type of stuff is very uh, common for me. Um, let's see if I can think of a recent one that's kind of dramatic. Um, well, um, I, I remember when my, my husband is a, is a member of the Order of Canada. It's like being knighted by the Queen. It's kind of a big deal. And, and uh, he was given his, his knighthood, if you will, at um, the, uh, the place uh, where the Governor General, the Queen's representative, lives. It's called Rideau Hall, and it's very old. And um, we were having a little tour of Rideau Hall. And I was passing one of the one of the rooms, one of the drawing rooms that had a fireplace in it. I saw this beautiful woman, and she appeared completely solid. And she was uh, wearing, you know, a gorgeous sort of a lavender-colored, you know, Victorian gown. And she had red hair, and it was up. And she and she turned and she smiled at me, and then she disappeared into 
thin air. Well, later on the tour, I saw a portrait. And although the dress was different, the woman in the portrait who had been the daughter of a, you know, a governor, uh, uh, a governor general from, you know, the 1850s or whatever, the, the portrait was that same woman. So I saw her solidly and uh, she was uh, she was looking at me and I think that she was just watching over the house. I don't think she was trapped there. I don't think that she had any trauma. I think she, she liked to pop in. And one of the things they said about her is she had been she had been the hostess for her father, the governor general. Maybe the mother had passed. She had been the hostess of that place for a long time. Where was this? This is a, this is in uh, uh, Ottawa, uh, Canada. It's it's a beautiful old building uh, dating from the 1700s called Rideau Hall. Rideau means wall in French. Rideau Hall. Okay, so when you saw her, was she two dimensional, three dimensional, solid? Semi solid, solid, three, three dimensional, dimensional. three dimensional, like, solid. Looked like an alive person. I thought she wasn't a live person. That happens to me all the time. <laughs> I thought she was actually living, and I thought she was maybe some, you know, sometimes these mansions and these old historic buildings, they have people that act as storytellers, and they dress in the, uh, the garb of the day. I thought that's what she was, or a guide who was dressing in the garb of the day, but then she disappeared in front of my eyes. I had a lot of experiences on a recent trip to England, too, but that's that's a whole nother that's a whole nother show, but I always see stuff and, and continue to this day. Um, so when was the first time you ever saw somebody who you thought, hey, oh, oh, let me back up. Okay, so have you seen anything that was not a human? Or the lady, besides the lady, let's see, you saw the men in black, you saw the lady who was with your client and then uh, who was the alien, the Nordic, you saw, you've seen ghosts. Have you seen anything else? I have occasionally seen uh, the small lights of small elementals, like, you know, like, like fairies or, or, you know, the tiny, tiny little elementals that work in the garden. And they, they exist. There's a whole other phylum of being. They're spiritual beings too. But they're very, uh, I, I was working with someone, a psychic who did that regularly. And she kind of taught me how to tune in to their energy. And they did show themselves to me. But only the tiny little ones. I've never seen any large ones. So how did you tune into their energy? Well, you have to kind of, like with everything, you kind of have to make your mind a blank. And then you have to send them a message of love and thanks for all that they do, you know, with the gardening. And you have to, and it has to be done at dusk. That's the only time to really see them. And then you have to simply send them a message with your mind asking for them to show themselves. And then they will sometimes, I've only seen them as little lights and, and tiny little beings, but other people have much more profound experiences seeing the elementals. I think, uh, what is the place in England now? Oh my gosh. The, the, the famous gardens where they, uh, the beautiful gardens where they see elementals all the time. Oh my Lord, why can't I remember that? Anyway, it's, uh, it, it's, it's not unusual. Um, so but, where, where have you been when you saw the elements? Where? I've been in different gardens, always in different gardens, my own gardens. I've been in the woods. I've been at, at uh, uh, but always, always you want to look for a lot of greenery. That's where, that's where you're going to see them. So is there one experience you've had with elementals that stands out in, in its uh, nature as far as how many you saw or any, and it stands out in any way in your mind, one particular experience? Well, the other night I had a pretty, pretty good experience with them. I was, I, I was out in my vegetable garden and I was very upset because the, you know, the raccoons are so aggressive and they're taking all my tomatoes before they're ripe. They just grabbed a whole crop of tomatoes went because of the raccoons. So I, I went outside and I put myself in the zone and I told the elementals, I said, I'm going to put 
I'm going to put a force field around the vegetable garden so you will be safe and I ask you to please protect the 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 plants that are giving their fruit that we need and I put and and then in my mind's eye uh, well I opened my eyes and I could see you know I had made a kind of a glowing uh, wrap around my vegetables I could sort of see that and then I saw the little elementals sort of using it as a um, <laughs> as a um, trampoline they were bouncing off the side of it and they thought it was hilarious so I created something that had enough matter you know uh, whatever it was etheric matter whatever it was it, it was enough for them to 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 perceive it and they thought it was hilarious and great fun and I could see, almost hear their little laughter and they were bouncing off of it so what did they look like? They well, they're so tiny, you know, they're almost bug like. Some of them seem to have wings very close to what very close to, uh, you know, what you would think from uh, from myth and legend that tiny little fairies look like. There's some there's somewhere between flying bugs and little tiny humans. They're 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 a their own thing. So, of all the, is there any uh, creature, alien, uh, uh, astral being, or ghost, or angel, or anything that you've encountered that was, that stands out in your mind as being more positive than everybody or everything else? Hmm. Like, a very positive experience you've had of any kind? I've had, I've had so many um oh my i'm sorry it's so hard to to have to uh, to have to pick something out that uh but i think um wh one of the most the most positive thing as far as seeing an entity happened and it has to do with the death of my brother and i don't normally talk about this but this stands out as the most positive thing um uh, my brother i was very close to him we were only a year apart and um and he passed away very suddenly from an unexpected heart attack. And he was not even, uh, you know, he was not even 50. I mean, he was in his 40s, so he was a young man. And I was, of course, completely grief stricken. Um, well, the night that he died, and I was in, I was on the East Coast. I was in New York City. I'm from New York City. So I was in New York City and, and my, my brother died in Los Angeles. So there's a three hour time difference. But at the time, but I, um, um, I had gone, tried to go to bed, but I couldn't sleep. I couldn't sleep at all. And um, I was up and I was watching one of my very favorite movies called, um, uh, always. It's a Steven Spielberg film and it has a lot to do with life and death. Anyway, I was watching that. I remember it very clearly. I was not asleep. My husband was asleep. I was wide awake. So then I heard what sounded like it was footsteps coming down my hallway. And I thought at first it was my older son who would have been about 10 at the time, but it sounded way too heavy for him. I called out to my eldest son, whose name is Chris, and I got no response. I heard the footsteps come down the door, and then the door of my bedroom just opened up. And I saw standing there my brother as he looked you know, in his 20s, in perfect health, and he was glowing. I mean, he was really looked like a spiritual being. He was glowing. He was beautiful. Now, I could only see him from the waist up, oddly. There was nothing from the waist down, but I saw this, and then he just smiled at me in the most beautific way, and the smile was, I'm all right. I'm happy. I made it. Don't grieve. And then he evaporated it was like and it, and it sound when he evaporated it sounded like static electricity like little ch -ch 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 little charges going off and my two cats at the time you know stood up on the bed and they were doing a halloween cat you know i had you know the big arched cat thing and i had tried to wake up my husband couldn't wake him up well i came to find out that now that would have been three that was three in the morning for me on the east coast at 11 at night, my mom, my mother, was in Los Angeles in grief, of course, and she heard 
in the kitchen what sounded like ice trays being used. Now, my brother always liked to drink a drink with a lot of ice in it, like a lot of Americans. So he had a lot of, he was always going for the ice trays. So my mother hears this sound. She knows it's 11 because the news is starting. She gets up, she goes into the kitchen and she sees the exact sight I saw. My brother from the waist up, looking like he was 20, glowing and smiling at her, and then he evaporates. So he actually, he sent a message to the two closest per people in his world, me and my mother, and he did it, and he bilocated. So we both got the same message in slightly different ways at the same time. All right. Well, that's that that's was, my story. That was <laughs> Now I see. I, unfortunately, it's I, I've I've got to go. It's seven thirty or more, and um, so I will be you know happy to come and talk to you again anytime that you like, Mike.